when God gave the nations, the church, He gave that nation the answer to their problems. Because God's kingdom is not just a spiritual place. What you don't know is that God's kingdom is a country. There's power in knowledge. There's power in information. There's power in knowing something. If you know what has been written concerning health, it is easy to claim healing. If you know what has been written concerning finance, it is easy to claim wealth. If you know what has been written concerning business, you, there are words in the scriptures that have you run to a life transforming experience as Pastor Prince Abbott brings you God's word with deep insights and power. God bless you. Amen. Good morning. God bless you. I want to appreciate everybody here. Appreciate all God's servants and everyone who is here this morning for yet another Amazing time in his presence. I'm going to open up with the first session this morning. Please, you may be seated. And then, um, amen. We're going to take about two to three sessions this morning. And after that, we'll go and come back for the last session in the night. Amen. Amen. Now, last, um, is that the first day, two days ago, I think it was the first night, I did a talk on the seven purposes of the church. How many of you got that message? That was a powerful one. And I know I, de- I dealt with two major keys or two major factors or purposes that guarantees for a powerful church. How many of you want to live here and have powerful ministries, powerful churches. Let me let you know this, that the church is the ground and pillar of truth. The church is the body of Jesus. The church is the organization that Jesus founded. Every other organization can be founded by human beings. Business can be founded by human beings. Uh, politics can be found and run by human beings, entertainment, sports, and all that. But what makes the church different from every other organization is that Jesus is the founder of the church. And if Jesus is the founder of the church, we must learn how to run the church the way Jesus organized it. I hope you know if you go to the government, the government has their modus operandi. There's a way they are organized. There's a way they run. You go to schools, they organize themselves the way they run. They have their modus operandi and all that. If you will run church, if you will do church and do it well, you have to know God's blueprints. You have to know how God ordained the church of Jesus to run. That you are running a church does not mean you are running, a, running it the God way. You can be doing church and doing it your own way. So God has his modus operandi. He has his blueprint. He has his own system for running his church. Now two days ago I showed you a few of those things that if you want to have church the God way. If you want to run church the way God has ordered it and ordained it to run, the way it is done in heaven, you must run on that. The first I showed you was worship. And the second I showed you was prayers. Because worship is a medium of exchange of values between God and man. One of my greatest value system is worship. God's presence is my greatest value. I don't value any other thing more than I value His presence. When Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and he was taking them into the promised land, remember that Pharaoh would not let the people go until there was different signs and wonders. Ten outstanding miracles that took place. And of course, when Pharaoh's son finally died, Pharaoh allowed the children of Israel to leave. 
And they began to journey. They got to the Red Sea and they crossed the Red Sea supernaturally. These were powerful miracles and all that that God did for these people. But guess what? When they got to the Mount of Sinai, Moses stopped the journey. And he began to pray a prayer. What was the prayer? God, may your presence go with us. Why would you be asking for God's presence to go with you when you've already performed miracles? This is one of the greatest prophets that has ever lived by the name of Moses. He came to Egypt. Pharaoh would not let the people go. He dropped his rod and the rod became a serpent. And swallowed all the snakes of the Egyptian magicians. This is the same Pharaoh that turned the whole river Nile into blood. The same Moses. This is the same Moses that made frogs fill the whole of Egypt and he destroyed the whole of Egypt. This is the same Moses that caused locusts to invade the whole farmland of Egypt. He destroyed their crops and destroyed everything. I want to think that if you have attained that kind of level of anointing, you think you've gotten it all. For many pastors and many preachers, once you've been able to perform miracles, once you are anointed, you're able to heal the sick and do some things, you have gotten it all. But Moses has or had a revelation higher than that. He knew that the anointing and the power to do miracles is only but a gift. It's like fruit. The presence of God is not one of the gifts of the Spirit. The presence of God is His person. And the greatest thing God can give you is not His gifts. The greatest thing God can give you is His person. And the person of God is the presence of God. And how do you get a connection or get in contact with this divine person called God? It's through worship. Are you starving of God around you? Then you need to go and get him around you. Thank you, gentlemen. Those of you who are behind, I like seeing people behind, but at the same time, I like seeing my audience in front. What was the point having you behind there when you can be in front? So, let me ask, except for the guy who is recording for me. Thank you, sir. I like it also coming from It's important. Thank you, sir. Can I say it again? The scarcest thing in the life of most believers is God's presence. And once the praise of God is not on your life, you are like every other human being. Because Moses said, where are we going to without your presence? What will differentiate us from other people out there, if not your glory? What is going to make us different? When other human beings see us, they will see us as different kind of people. What is that thing that will make us different, Lord? Accept your presence. One of the mistakes we have in the body of Christ today, and we have these mistakes amongst ministers of the gospel, is that we have a lot of theoretical ministers, we have a lot of political minded ministers, we have a lot of uh, intellectual ministers who do not have the glory of God on their life. Who lack the presence of God on their life. You see them, they look like every other person. There's no distinguishing factor. Do you know that Moses was willing to suspend that journey for 40 solid days and 40 solid nights? He went up to the mountain. What was he looking for? Not anointing the face of God. He was looking for God's glory. He was looking for God's anointing. He was looking for God's person. Right now. You remember, if you know, when he was on the mount, when he had finished that 40 days encounter, God gave him the Ten Commandments and all that, and then he was about to leave. And the Moses held God and said, you're not going anywhere. You're not done with me yet. And I'm not done with you. And God was like, what else do you want? He said, show me your glory. He said, show me your face. 
God said to Moses, I thought you were asking me for presents. I already showed you presents there. He said, no. That one you showed me in Shekinah. It's manifest presence. That one you can feel it when you come to church and worship is going on. Oh, you feel sweet and you feel good. It's like romance and all that. That one is just one side of God's presence and glory. There's a deeper dimension of God's glory that is called the weight of God's glory. The person of God's glory. The Greek calls it dogger. That one is deep. That's where God reveals himself, reveals his nature, reveals who he is, reveals his character to you. And of course God told Moses, I'm going to show you, but I won't show you my face. Because no man will see it and leave. So let me show you my back. And as I show you my back, you're going to see everything that makes me God. You will see that I am God so loving. I am God merciful. I am God kind. You're going to see my nature. You're going to see that real thing that makes me God. That's why you can have with the anointing but without the character of God in them. You can have many preachers with power but they don't have the aura of God on them. You can have many preachers with anointing to heal the sick, but they don't have the passion of God in them. They don't have the love of God in their hearts. The scripture says that the knowledge of the glory of God shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. One of the biggest things God wants to be known all over the world is His glory. It's not His power. The truth is that when you contact with the glory of God, the power of God is a package inside. The anointing is a package inside. Uh, wisdom is a package inside. All kinds of things you can think about is a package inside the glory. Somebody took me somewhere to show me a house he wants to sell. When I got there, I noticed that the whole house has everything you need to have inside. The house has furniture. The living room is already furnished. There are air conditions. There's television. There's refrigerator. The kitchen is furnished. The utensils are there. The bedroom is furnished. The living room, the bedrooms, everything furnished. So that means you don't need to buy anything again. All you need to do is pay for the house. You know, collect your receipts and move in. The only thing that needs to move in is you. You don't need to move in with anything else because the house is already furnished to taste. So you don't need to run around looking for chair again. Chairs inside the house. And God told me that day, that's how my presence is. Once people get my presence, everything they are looking for is locked up inside. Stop pursuing the, 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 the fruit. Get the tree. Stop pursuing the fruits. You can collect fruit today. You're hungry tomorrow. Get the tree in your house. That tree produces the fruit. You won't need to go to the market again. It's the glory of God. And it is that presence that makes all the difference. Have you been in ministry as a pastor and then you're frustrated? This is the reason. You've done ministry in the South South in Onweke. You feel like shutting down. Everything is frustrating you. The city is hard for you. The city is frustrating you. Everything is upside down. The problem is so that the city is hard. You have not met with God. A lot of us are interested in meeting with governor. Interested in meeting with senator. Interested now, local government chairman, that we are interested in meeting with God. We are interested in political activity. Election. That one and that one. So many things that get our attention. God. There's something that makes Pharaoh a God, make Moses a God before Pharaoh. When he appeared before Pharaoh, he was a God. He was not a mere man again. I like Moses. He's always wanted to know who God is. That's why when he was going, 
Ah, God appeared to Moses in burning bush, appeared to him in all kinds of whatever. One thing he said, put your hand here and bring it out. It became leprosy. Put it again. It became clean. At one point he said, okay, look at the bush. There is burning. Remove your sand away. Your stand is the Holy Ghost. All that was not enough for Moses. Moses was still asking God. When I go to Pharaoh, who do I tell him sent me? And then God said to Moses, tell him, I am that I am sent you. That's all Moses needs. Do you know I am? And you can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't make any difference. What makes the difference is that you know him. So when we teach worship, we teach, we t- I tell people, it's not about the singing. It's about knowing God. Worship is an invitation to know God. Worship introduces you to God. And worship introduces God to you. His presence becomes known. His person becomes real. Of course, I don't want to get into all that because I already dealt with it. Number two is worship. Number two is prayer. I'll do the number three now. These are the purposes of a church. One is to worship God. Number two is to pray. Number three, break bread. Breaking of bread. Show again Acts of the Apostles chapter two and read from verse 40 again to verse 47. Any church that does not understand the power of communion will be having defeats. I'm going to show you something on the power of communion. Read it very quickly. Thank you, sir. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, from verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exalted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines Mm -hmm. and fellowship, Mm -hmm. in the breaking of bread, Mm -hmm. and in prayers. And in prayers. In the breaking of what? What does it mean to break bread? It's communion. Let me prove it to you. Jesus initiated this ritual. Communion is the ritual of the church. Hear this and hear this very well. The church of Jesus is not a social club. The church of Jesus is a cult. Okay, let that one sink. The church of Jesus is not a social club. The church of Jesus is a cult. And every cult is known for one thing. Blood and power. Any cult that does not carry out blood ritual is not a powerful cult. Oh God, help me show these people this thing. I know a lot of you are religious in this land. Well, let God help you. So you will get this thing. You become a walking God. Satan cannot mesmerize you again. You can't be messing up with you anymore. There is power in the communion table. I don't know if you do communion in your churches. I want to reveal to you some mysteries in communion. It is one of the ordinances that God instituted in the body of Christ. Any church that does not observe it is not a powerful church. Communion is not our idea. Communion is what Jesus introduced into the body. And he gave us an instruction to do it. Luke chapter 22, read verse 19. Thank you, sir. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. And he took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying this is my blood which is given for you Mm -hmm. do this in remembrance of me Mm -hmm. likewise he also took the cup after supper saying Mm -hmm. this cup is the new covenant in Mm -hmm. my blood Mm -hmm. which is shed for you Mm -hmm. but behold the hand of my betrayer is with me okay that's okay you see two things that he talked about one bread what does he call the bread his body 
he took wine and he gave thanks and gave it to them and said, drink. This is my blood shed for you. What does he call the wine? Blood. This is one of the highest ritual in the body of Christ. One of the greatest ritual in the body of Christ. One of the purpose of communion is that when the body, that is the church, partakes in that ritual, they become one with Christ. I don't, I'm not getting the vibe. I mean, this morning, if you are sleeping, then ask God to wake you up. You need to understand what I'm saying here. A communion is not just about bread and wine. Communion is about the body of Jesus that was broken. And it's about the blood of Jesus that was shed. It's not something for unbelievers. An unbeliever cannot partake of it. He can't eat of that blood. He can't eat of that body. Because it's not part of this fold. It's not part of this faith. When you gave your life to Jesus, when you became a born again, a new creation, you became qualified to partake of that ritual. What it means is that you are now one with Christ. By partaking of the communion, you are now, you are saying that we are initiated in the covenant. We are one in the covenant. We are one with Jesus. We are part and parcel of his body. We are saying that the blood of Jesus that was shed on, cro- on, on the cross of Calvary flows in our vein. When Jesus died on the cross, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. And when he rose from the grave, we rose with him. One of the things, the shedding of the blood of Jesus did, is that it brought remission to the sins of man. The blood of goats, bulls, and cows, and cattle could not wipe away the sins of man. In the Old Testament, we use the blood of goats to atone for sin. What does it mean to atone for sin? It means to cover sin. And it could only last for one year. So, when a man sins, you bring a goat and then put the man's hand on the goat. The man will confess all his sins... And then as he's confessing the sins, all the sins of that man is being transferred to the goat. Once the sins are transferred, they take the goat away into a far wonderland and let it wander. That's how that guy's sin is taken away. Then after one year, that ritual expires. You bring another goat. The man does the same thing again. They kept doing it and God said, how long will they continue like this? Let me give them a once and for all sacrificial lamb. And that's how Jesus came and died on the cross and shed his blood. So the goats were atoning for sins, but the blood of Jesus remitted our sin. What it means is that the blood of Jesus wiped out completely. There's no record of your sins anywhere again. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creation. All things have passed away and all things have become new. Can I hear an amen? amen? One important thing you must understand about the blood of Jesus is that it had the power, has the power to wipe the away sins completely. If you ever gave your life to Jesus before and you accepted him in your heart, God sees you a new creation. It's your confusion that is making you think you're a sinner. That's the advantage the devil has over you, your ignorance. He uses what you don't know to oppress you. I'm a new creation, saved, washed by the precious blood of Jesus. The day I gave my life to Christ, His blood washed me clean. And there's therefore now not one condemnation to me, because I'm in Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, can I announce to you that Jesus gave us the communion table to remember what he did for us on the cross. You see, his body was also broken there. Why? So that by his stripes we were healed. What it means is, anybody who is sick, if you are a Christian and you are sick, and I administer the communion to you, that blood, that wine you are taking, is the blood of Jesus. That bread you are taking is the blood of Jesus. It's the body of Christ. Once I administer it to you, what I'm doing is the same thing that Jesus did on the cross. 
I'm reenacting the same ordinance, the same stuff Jesus did on the cross is what I'm reenacting and it's as powerful as what he did on the cross. If I bring you to the communion table, it is as, as it is the same thing as bringing you to the foot of the cross where Jesus was crucified. What I'm telling you is also this. If somebody is dying around you, somebody is about to die, lose his life completely. If you understand the power of communion, you can bring him back to life. You see why the church is flawless? Why we're full of theory? We're only full of talk? And we don't have signs and wonders. No demonstration of the spirit of God amongst us. No demonstration of the move of God. No demonstration of the power of God. Because we don't understand these rituals that God instituted in the kingdom, in the body. Every believer should have communion. Communion is not something you do only when you come to church. You need a communion table in your house. Sometimes you should wake up in the morning, go to your communion table. Take and, and take the body. And then re- come in agreement with maybe your family or whatever. Enforcing the things that Jesus did. Your word says that by your stripes we were healed. So I declare as I take this communion, there's no sickness in my body. Somebody suffering cancer, bring the blood of Jesus. Somebody suffering HIV, bring the blood of Jesus. Take that person to the communion table. You will see what is going to happen. I usually tell this testimony and then anytime I tell it, I don't know, it's to inspire people so you understand this. Listen to me. I think it's lying around you. Understand the power in the covenant. That's what they call the blood covenant. Understand the power that is in the covenant. We have a lot of religious churches. You look at people, they're looking poor, looking broke, they're looking broken, they're looking so worn out, looking so tattered, and then they're complaining, we are poor. And I say, no, you are rich in Christ. You just need to know how to enforce what he has done for you. We are not without help. It's your ignorance that puts you in a helpless situation. When my wife was pregnant with her baby, of course, she began to have some spotting. Blood was coming out. She ran to me one morning and showed me. She said, see blood coming out. That's what you call miscarriage, eh? Hmm? Hello? Simple. I just went and got communion. And I administered it. I said, take it. I said, now, which blood is superior? Is it the blood of Jesus or the blood of this baby? I command you, baby, obey the blood. Return back now. Simple. Ten months later, the baby came forth. It's an understanding. It's not two ways about it. It's an understanding. The blood of Jesus is so powerful that it can wipe away the sins of man it can wash the entire world. It can wipe away the sins of Africa. It can wipe away the sins of America. The blood of Jesus is so powerful. Not just that it takes care of sins, it can take care of your problems. You need to start doing a study on the covenant. Understand what the blood covenant is all about. Don't play with the communion table in your churches if you want to have a vibrant church. Don't play with the communion table in your ministries, in your homes. If you want to have a vibrant family, if you want to have a vibrant ministry, you want to have a vibrant church, the secret is understanding the power of the communion. And I'm saying it to every pastor here, irrespective of your denomination, irrespective of your church, irrespective of whatever. Train your people to be experts Christians. Train your people to be professional Christians. 
professional priest. You don't need a pastor to do these things for you. This is what everybody in the church should know. Can you imagine that you're a member of a cult? If you've watched Nigerian movies, you see cult groups. You see, when you watch movies, like maybe Blood Money, or you watch Billionaire's Club, all those Nigerian movies, you notice they have a cult. And this cult, hey, this way. You notice that the court groups have members. Hmm? And then all the members of the court group maybe converge at the court, you know, forum. Maybe once a week, twice a week, as the case may be. And when they come, they wear their maybe red and black. Are we together? And then they observe rituals. Maybe they bring human sacrifice, kill the human, spill the blood. And then they drink of the blood and all that. That's one. Do you also notice that each of those cult members have their own cult room in their houses? Have you noticed? They have their secret rooms. So when they finish from the general temple, when they go back to their house, you see that there are some rooms they write out of bound. Even their wife don't enter there. You, you see, the same thing that you have in the main court is the same thing you have in that secret room. That when they go out to the market, they are the most powerful guys. They go to their business place, they are the most powerful guys. They go to their hospitals, they are the most powerful guys. And then church people are the ones dying. Church people are the ones doing business, their businesses are failing. Church people are the ones doing politics and they are failing. Church people are the ones doing ministry. Go to your churches, it's where two or three are gathered. Go to your churches, it's where five are meeting. And they don't understand what is going on in that ministry. But when you go to where Ogboni people meet, they have crowd. You come to make here, there are altars. There are altars in the land. And periodically, they are bringing sacrifices there. Like we are talking about yesterday. You see, human sacrifices, they are bringing on the altars, they are shedding human blood, shedding blood of animals and all kinds of things, and they have powerful altars controlling the whole nation. And church people are busy clapping hands because you don't understand your priesthood. God never intended for a priest to be a normal person. There's a story of a certain girl who entered a bus. And a certain man also entered the bus. And while the bus was moving, a young guy stood up and said he wanted to preach. While he opened his mouth and said he preaching, another one stood up, another man stood up and said, my friend, sit down. No more, don't preach here. And the man said, no, I'll preach. He said, I have warned you. If you preach in this bus, I'll deal with you. The man ignored him, opened his mouth and began to preach. Why he began to preach? The young man stood up here and said, So you want to tell me? I have warned you not to preach, and you are still preaching. I am now begin to undress. Guess what? The preacher removed his clothes and began to undress. Became a madman overnight. Began to undress. Began to take off his clothes. Began to undress. While he was still undressing, a small girl inside the vehicle stood up. I said, Oga, what are you doing? I command you in the name of Jesus Christ. Dress up right now. And the guy began to dress up. Began to dress. The old bony man looked at the guy and said, Who are you? So you want to try me? He said, Why won't I try you? By the blood of Jesus, I command you, you yourself, undress. The old man began to remove his clothes. Why? Because this other guy did not understand power. The other guy understands the power in the name of Jesus and the power in the blood of the Lamb. What is breaking my heart is when I see church play religion and the world out here is carrying dominion. The day the church of Jesus understands this, you think there will be a space for witches and wizards? Have light ever appeared in your house and darkness is still contending? There's darkness in your house and neighbor comes now. And darkness is still looking for how to find one place and stay. Darkness disappears. Darkness is no more powerful than light. What makes darkness powerful is the absence of light. This is where 
problem is. That's why you can be in Omri Kenya, claiming pastor, claiming bishop, claiming Christian, dragging position, dragging this, dragging that, and then everywhere is still upside down. Because people do not know the rituals that God instituted in the body of Christ. That when we practice them and we know them and practice them, these things make us powerful. It makes the whole nations begin to come to us. The church of Jesus is not a place for theory. The church of Jesus is a place for the demonstration of the power of God. The communion table is a powerful place. It's not just communion. When you come to church, you take communion and go away. That's not it. You don't know what you're doing. Communion is ritual. It's blood sacrifice. And every Christian who is saved, washed by the precious blood of Jesus, is qualified to take it. Let me show you one error the church commits. Usually the church selects people who are qualified for communion and then eliminates other people who are not supposed to take communion. There's only one category of people who are not qualified for communion. They are called sinners. Unbelievers. People who have not accepted Jesus cannot take the communion. But if you have accepted Jesus, you are qualified for it. Very qualified for it. Communion is given for your own good and advantage. Communion is not so you can qualify. It's not for qualified people. Communion qualifies you. <laughs> you don't need to be qualified in any whatever. Communion is what qualifies you to receive the riches, receive the things, receive all that Jesus has paid for you. Playing with it is telling Jesus, I do not want what you have died for. I do not want the things you have given me. I don't want to be powerful. I just want to be a normal Christian and that's it. If somebody is hearing me now, say, I'm hearing you, sir. When I take the communion, oh my God. Sometimes we get so busy that we forget this thing. If you can, make communion a daily practice. You will control the affairs of life. You need one in your house. Just like you take communion in church, you need one in your house. We do it in our own ministry. First Sunday of every new month. This period, I want to even make it more periodical. One of the best breakfasts you can take is communion. You see, even the Orthodox Church, like the Catholic understands it, maybe that is why you see them controlling things here and there. Sometimes I go, I wonder, what are they teaching? How this crowd? Where are they? You know, the Orthodox Church, the Catholic, is one church that understands some of the ordinances of Jesus. They know like Easter night is coming. They are practicing almost everything. All those, they are Ash Sunday, they are Palms, this one, they are this one, that one. They understand those rituals. They may not preach better than us, but one thing I've seen about, they understand those rituals. They understand the Passion Week. Before the death of Jesus, they know the things are followed through. Then that Easter week, Easter Friday, the Easter, I wanted to buy a Catholic in particular, you know, wanted to give him wine for something he did for me. One of, and he said, no, pastor, this period we are not drinking. And this guy in question is a drunkard. If you see when you season and drink 12 bottles of star here, you will wonder. But this other week, he's not drinking. They are not permitted to drink anything. If you give him meat, he says no. He doesn't eat meat now. And when it's time for them to carry that cross and find somebody they will torture on behalf of Jesus, they will, you see how the whole crowd will follow and they are going from place to place, carrying that stuff everywhere. And they will practice it. They do everything. It will look real. They understand the ordinances of our faith. We, we don't understand it. They say Pentecostals are Pentecostals. We don't understand it. We just come, clap, jump, and go away. We do not know these precious stones that God instituted in the body to make us a powerful organization. The church of Jesus is not a man's idea. The church of Jesus is not a political organization. The church of Jesus is not a religious organization. The church of Jesus is not an organization created by any man. 
is the organization that was founded by Jesus himself. And if you are a minister of the gospel and you want to do it well, you need to know how Jesus ordained it to be. Don't build the church according to your own pattern. Build it according to the pattern of Jesus. Then you will get results that will daze your mind. Don't copy governments to build the church. Don't copy the secular world to build the church. Copy the model of Christ. Copy how God of them. That's why anytime I want to understand the thing, how a thing works in the body, I go to the scripture and I find out, like actually the apostles chapter 2, you see the model church. That's why I'm able to teach you the purpose of the church. Like I'm teaching you on prayers, I'm teaching you on worship, and I'm teaching you on the communion table. Did you see that the early church were committed to breaking bread? That's communion. You can decide to have communion services once a month, twice a month, whatever. Make sure your service don't run without communion. Make sure your church is not void of communion. Have a table. Maybe with the wax material. Then with the shrew bread. And what do you call the other one? The wine with cups. And then, once you have that set, just your prayer alone as a priest. Just know how to bless communion. Using scriptures. Bless the wine, bless the bread. The moment you do that, that is not how wine. It's not the blood. The moment you bless that bread, that bread, that wine, at least that it it can cure HIV patients. It can deal with cancer. It can deal with poverty. Listen, I don't run a church where I'm the only one who knows these truths. By God's grace, God is entrusting multitude of people into me, especially young people. And I'm training them in this so that I'm not the only one who knows this. Sometimes some people in my church maybe have one or two issues. I tell them, ah, ah, you should know this thing by now. I won't pray for you. Go and deal with it yourself. Simple. Come in and go and take care of it. You are diagnosed of an ailment or whatever it is. It's a simple thing. Go to the communion table. You should have one in your house. If you come to my study, you see I have a communion. I even need to go and restock it now. You have bread there. You have wine there. Whatever I don't like, I just go there and bring my petition before the table. Opening men wants to get contract. What do they do? They enter that their secret chamber. Apart from the one in their main court, whatever. They enter that their secret chamber. And they go there and say, Oh, great Jamfa. Oh, great Jamfa. They say, Your servant has come. Accept my sacrifice. And Jamfa accepts the sacrifice. And the guy begins to talk. He say, Jamfa, I want to become the new CMD, Chief Medical Director of the, of the General Hospital or the FMC. And Jampa will say, ha, ha, ha. You are going to give us 30 human hairs from the hospital. He said, Jampa, may it be done according to your wish. And he will now collect blood and drink. Collect bread and drink. When he finally goes to the hospital, they bring a Christian brother to the hospital. Just small head echo. Just small fever. The guy dies here. Because you don't understand that you are the sacrifice. You just enter the hospital. You don't know that there are powers that be in the marketplace. A believer just goes to the market in the name of doing business. He just goes anywhere in the name of doing transactions. He just goes anywhere in the name of doing politics. Can't you see that the world is wiser than us? We are fighting with people who have power. And then we are powerless. Recently I got reports from Funa here equal that they are ki- stu- young people are dying anyhow now. Youth, you see them in their twenties, they are in their twenty one, twenty two, eighteen. They are dying anyhow, and the people are wondering what is going on. I say you don't understand what is going on. I say yeah, I know. This is a matter of blood. There are altars everywhere. I went to a market, the international market here in Abakliki. And I was speaking with the chairman, the general chairman of the market. 
There's a meeting I wanted to do for all the people there. And then the man said to me, he said, Pastor, this meeting you're talking about, we need it to. The only problem we are going to have is that there are people who will fight it. I said, which people will fight it? He said, the bad guys. He said, there are guys here who use automobile. There are guys here who use all kinds of fetish powers, occultic powers to do business. And I further asked the man, what does their business look like? He said, you need to go there, traffic. They are the ones selling morning and night. They are the ones who are taking over the marketplace. Then you go to the ones that are run by our Christian brothers. You notice that they are all dried. Why? They don't understand what power is. They just wake up in the morning and go to the market thinking that that is all they need, skills and all that to trade. They inspire for success. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? You need one of those stuff in your house. When you go on my friend, go and get a communion table. There are places in your house that should be out of bound. When the forces of the world seem fighting and terrorizing you, what do you do? You go into that sacred closet and bring your battle before God. If we understand this, if we understand this, if we understand this, then the church will be too powerful for the devil to trade with. Glory to God. I say glory to God. I'm going to leave this one because there are deeper things to say in it. Let me get to the fourth one. Hmm. Fourth purpose of the church is teaching. Write it down. Teaching. Teaching. Read the same Acts again. Let's get that same Acts. Acts chapter 2. Then read from verse 40. From verse 42. Thank you, sir. Acts chapter 2 from verse 40. 42. 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods. And okay, now read Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. Thank you, sir. Second Timothy 4, verse 1 to 2. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince. Rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Did you see that? Exhort with all long suffering and what? Ask yourself, is your church a teaching church? Or is your church just making one noise here? Show them again Matthew chapter twenty eight, verse eighteen. Twenty-eight, verse eighteen, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, "All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Baptizing them in the name of the Father Mm -hmm. and of the Son Mm -hmm. and of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. teaching them to observe all things. Teaching them to do what? Observe all things. Can you echo? Teaching them to do what? Observe all things Mm -hmm. that I have commanded you. That I have commanded you." One of the greatest mark of a true shepherd is the ability to teach. One of the greatest signs of a vibrant church, of a church that is very useful to God, is his ability to teach. And what do you teach? The word of God. One of the errors we have now in the end time church is that the teaching ministry seems to be missing now. It's very, very missing. And that is why we are raising all kinds of animals for slaughter. We are raising half-baked Christians. We are raising Christians who are not formidable. We are raising Christians who cannot stand on their own. We are raising Christians who are falling victims to false prophets. False prophets 
are on the loose. False teachers are on the loose. There's a story and an account of the Berean Christians. Maybe you've heard about them. Paul commended them for one thing. He said, each time you are taught, you go back home and go and do further research to know if what they are teaching you is true. What is that thing that makes that church like that? They are a church of people who are taught the word. You cannot deceive that kind of church. You see why there's a lot of dent on the image of the church? is because the church of Jesus did not train their people. We didn't teach our people. So there arose a generation of false preachers, a generation of false prophets that came on board and began to carry out all kinds of fetish practices and then destroy lives and destroy people. And then giving the church a terrible image. You can't deceive a Christian who is grounded in the world. When I start teaching heresy now, there are people around me who will know this thing is out of order. Why? Because they have been taught the word and they are also taught to read the word. If you know what the teaching ministry will do for your church, it will raise solid Christians. Christians who are able to stand on their own. Good morning, sir. Christians who are able to set things on their own. Solid Christians. I'm not against supernatural. I flow in that office also. But what do you use supernatural to do? Especially if you're here, you're calling, you feel I'm a prophet, I'm called to supernatural and all that, healing miracles. You use that to bring people in. Supernatural is fishing nets. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Miracle signs and wonders, fishing nets. This is how you bring the crowd in. You know, children like adverts. Children like wonder. One day I was carrying my little baby up. I was throwing her. When I throw her up, she would just shout in the air. Hey, I throw you. Hey, I throw She would. I now ask somebody around me, a mature person. I say, you see the way I'm throwing my baby up and she's so happy. Because it's wonderful to her. I say, imagine I carry you as an adult. Maybe carry my wife as an adult. And I'm throwing her up like that. Won't it be amusing? Won't it be funny? That's not for her. She's a mature person. When I take the child and throw her up, everything is amazing to her. That's wonder to her. But that's not for the adult. Miracles are for children. For the adult, you are the miracle. For the Christian who is mature, you are the one God packaged as a miracle to your world. But once we want to bring it to the fold, it is miracles we package for them. For the ones who are still babies in the body, it is miracles we package just to attract them. It's like adverts. For instance, if I'm driving on the highway and I see Indomie advert on the billboard, can I eat that Indomie, dear? What's the purpose of the Indomie advert? Is to attract me to Indomie company. So I can buy the product. The purpose of the advert is to attract me to the product. The purpose of miracles is to attract people to Jesus. Now when they have been attracted to Jesus, you don't keep them, you don't arrest them by miracles. You arrest them by teaching them. You know when I'm going everywhere doing missions, I don't care whether anybody understands it or not. A time is coming, you understand. I'm paying my price for a boy now. Because there are all kinds of fakeness everywhere. Fake prophets are on the loose. And they are using all kinds of schemes to destroy people's lives. Arranging miracles everywhere. They bring parties and hide it somewhere. And when they tell you, pray, pray, close your eyes, pray. Somebody brings it out from the lead and puts it on the ground. And they say, open your eyes, see, 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 see. Everybody shouting. Where did the tortoise come from? From one of their pockets. It's time we run those guys out of town. And how do you run them out? Is by getting the teaching ministry right. Teaching people. It's not by catching them and beating them. It's just by opening the eyes of people to know what the truth of the world is. They need to be given the revelation of Jesus. Teach them who Jesus is. 
Teach them about the death of Jesus, about the life of Jesus, about Jesus on the cross. Teach them about all the things he went through for the remission of the sins of man. Teach them about his resurrection. Teach them. Give them a revelation of Jesus. Teach them about his ministry here on earth. Let them know Jesus for themselves. Do you know the shocking thing is that when people know Jesus, you have cured the problem of backsliding. Mm -mm, Yes, 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 yes. When people know Jesus for themselves, you have cured to a large extent the problem of backsliding. Why do people backslide? They are looking for something else other than Jesus. So they are in church waiting for miracles. The miracles don't show, they change church. They are in church for their selfish motive. The day you offend them, they change church. You see a lot of trans church shifts everywhere, church migration going on everywhere. Why? Because we have lost our teaching ministry. If you're here, sir, I'm here, sir, I'm here, sir. Mm. Ah, I don't want to take more time again on this. Let me show you one more. One more, one more, one more. Just one more and we're close. There are actually seven. Hmm. I've done four. No, I'll just do one. And then I'll get to the next session. Maybe in the evening. This evening is going to be explosive or what? Fire will fall here. <laughs> Number five purpose, fellowship. Fellowship. The scripture talked about forsaking not the fellowship of the brethren, as it is in the manner of some. So for when we fellowship together, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all Sins. First John chapter one verse seven. So you see, Jesus instructs that we do not forsake fellowship. The call to fellowship is not a suggestion; it's a commandment. I want to say that again. The call to fellowship is not a suggestion; it's a commandment. And fellowship is in twofold. One, there's fellowship with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Ghost. First John chapter one verse three. I think it says it there. It says our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Now there's also fellowship with brethren. The greatest cult in the world know the power in fellowship. It's another form of communion. Especially the fellowship that is done in unity. I'm teaching you what you should go back and go and emphasize in your churches. Especially if you're a pastor here. Teach your brethren that these things are not things we choose to do. They are things that God ordained. And Jesus instructed we must do it if the church is going to be powerful in the land. It's so shocking that the Bible says when we gather together in fellowship, the blood of Jesus cleanses. So for just gathering, we activate the blood. Hello, somebody. For just gathering, what do we do? We activate the blood. Do you know also the scripture says, where two or three are gathered in my name, he is don't ever be deceived by the new age doctrine flying all over the place now. The hyper grace doctrine flying over the place. That church is not about the building. We don't need to gather in the building to have church. That you are the church. You can be in your house and have church. My friend, listen. There's a difference between offline church and online church. I've tried the online. I do the online. I'm not sure anybody here understands online church than me. I know online church better. I do internet better. I'm, all, I'm on all the social media handle. I've proven, I've seen that the difference between offline gathering and online gathering is different. It's so clear. So now I know a group of young ministers and some people who are on the TV are everywhere. They are saying, no, we don't need to gather. People can be in their house having fellowship. No, when you are sick, why don't stay in your house and collect medicine online? You have cancer. You would have sat in your house and hook up to FETA online. Hook up to FMC online and collect your 
medicine. Why do you have to go to a hospital? The devil is tampering with some precious stones in the body of Christ. And as apostles, those of us who are in that ministry, our job is to preserve them. Maybe you don't know, I'm called into the office. Our job is to preserve those precious stones of the Christian faith. The devil is trying to tamper with someone. One of it is fellowship now. You see the way brethren can miss fellowship. You can put your service, they can decide to take off on journey. You can put a revival meeting, they can decide to go to market, do whatever they want to do. If people select what, I heard you suffer that in one way a lot. You have to go and teach your brethren. That God instructs that people must gather. When they gather, God is invited. He said, where two or three gathers in my name, I am there. I've never seen where one gathers in my name, I'm there. It doesn't mean God does not appear where one gathers. Corporate ministry. It's one of the ways to activate divinity. God just shows up. Because one or two, three people gather together. God says, are they there in my name? Oh yeah, let me show. And the way he shows up, the Bible says automatically the blood of Jesus begins to cleanse people from their sins. Even when you have not confessed your sins, the blood begins to wipe. It begins to clear. The blood begins to perfect us. If the impurities in our lives, shortcomings, weaknesses, just for being in fellowship, the blood begins to perfect us. I've always told people, anytime you take me out of fellowship, that's why I can't sit down. I finish from Ezra now I'm in Afipo. The missions conference for Afipo is being planned already. I finish from there and I'm in Hosea. That's the only way I can stay safe. You take me out of fellowship, I begin to draw back in certain areas of my life. I know this thing. Even the holiest of men will draw back when you get out of fellowship. Listen, spiritual things are very slippery. Anytime a brethren is telling you, sir, I'm having fellowship in my house. I'm having my Bible study. I don't need to come to church. You know, I'm so busy. Watch backsliding. I've started. Pastor, I'm doing my personal quiet time. I'm actually having sweet fellowship with the Holy Spirit at home. That's a fat life from hell. Even God does not fellowship alone. He has a trinity. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Ghost. When he wanted to create the universe, he said, let us make, when he wanted to create man, rather, he said, come now, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them. He didn't say, and let him. He is creating just one man. Why is he saying let them? What it means is that the man God was designing was designed with an innate ability and potential to relate with others, to fellowship with others. So when you are going the direction of self, individualism, egocentrism, no, I, I can fellowship on my own, I can have my Bible study on my own, you are breaking kingdom ordinances. You are breaking kingdom ordinances. One of the purpose of the church is for brethren to fellowship together. The same Jesus that died for one, died for all. The same Jesus that died for you, died for others. And the body of Jesus is not you alone. You see this beauty where we are? Is he only one block that makes it? Hmm? You want to build the house, you carry only one block and put. You can't build the house with one block. Is he only one pillar that makes the house? Hmm? Is he only one uh, plank on the roof that makes the house? Hello somebody? Okay, is this house all blocks? There are woods somewhere, is that correct? Is this house all wood? If you take very well, they are tied somewhere. Hmm? Can't you see there are glasses somewhere also? What do you call that? Different components coming together to form one house. And Jesus is the head of the church where his body. I've never seen a headless body. If you see a headless body, it's a monster. I hope you know if you see one, you will take off now. If you don't take off, you begin to plead the blood of Jesus. You begin to bind and cast. How many of you know that? So any church without Jesus as his head is a monster. Hmm? Any church that does not have obeisance to the
headship of Christ is a monstrous church. That's why in choosing a church to go to, when you enter, find out, does the head there, the pastor, does he submit to Christ? Paul said, follow me as I follow. So the condition for being a member of any church is to check, is the man of God there following Christ? But just like you have a body with a head, you also need a body, on, sorry, just like you have a head on top of everybody, you also need a body for the head to function. Just like Jesus is the head of the church, Jesus also needs the church made up of different parts. Do you know the danger of not being in fellowship with one another? You are denying Jesus his effectiveness. When people do that, they'll go send treason in the body of Christ. They don't know, they are denying Jesus the effectiveness of the body. i give you a very clear example. If your hand wakes up tomorrow and says, I'm no longer in this body. I don't care about this body. I want to be on my own. Or your leg wakes up in the morning and says, I do not care about this body. I want to be on my own. Or your eyes wakes up in the morning and says, I don't care about this head. I want to be independent on my own. Or your nose wakes up in the morning and says, I don't care about this body. I want to be independent on my own. Do you think your body will be effective again? Do you know why Jesus instituted fellowship in the body of Christ? It's for the effectiveness of the body. That you must understand that in the body of Christ, you take a certain position. And then you play certain roles that others cannot play. Maybe in the body of Christ, you are the eye. The one in charge of maybe seeing. Maybe in the body of Christ, you are the nose. The one in charge of smell. Maybe in the body of Christ, you are the leg. The one in charge of moving. Maybe in the body of Christ, you are the hands. The one in charge of touching and carrying things. The day you stop seeing that you are called to be a player of certain roles in the body of Christ, the body will start suffering. That's why if one part of the body is sick now, your body for instance, maybe your nose is bleeding. I hope you know your head is going to feel the pain. Hmm? So Jesus feels certain pains when we do certain things. The church is not about your team. The church is about the corporate vision of Christ. The church is not about your ambition. It's not about what you want to do or what you don't want to do. It's about the corporate vision of Christ. Find your place in the body of Jesus and play your role. All of us may not be called into the pastoral work. But there are people who may be called to do other things in the body of Christ to make it effective. There are some people whose job may be called even into cleaning the church. Like this morning when I came in, I saw that this space was already clean. It's not the senior pastor who did that. There are people whose role it is to do it. And if they don't do it, the senior pastor will suffer in his work. One of my sons came and told me, he says, I went to a particular church here in Onuiki and I cried and I cried and I cried. I said, why did you cry? What happened? He said, because when I got there, it was a senior pastor and the wife that was setting up the whole place. So the pastor and the wife was the one taking care of the whole place, sweeping the whole place, cleaning the whole place, arranging the whole place. Reverend, sir, the next time I'm going to come to Anweke, you do me a favor. You and PFN chairman and the can chairman, all the churches who are in the next... You know, sometimes when we come to help people, they think we came for some other reasons. Some people start thinking that maybe, you know, whatever. We are not like that. God has made us useful vessels in the vineyard to help the body of Christ. These things we've been saying here for three solid days. If every church in Onuike, if every pastor in this city and all the brethren had this thing, would have helped you guys a long way. You can imagine what happens to the church where the pastor and the wife is the one that sets the seat. And then the brethren choose to come anytime they want to come. And just like I asked one of my boys, I said, what time do the people come for this program in the morning? He said, sir, the time is supposed to be 8 a.m. 
But they say the people come by 10. I said, that's an error. Reverend, challenge that. If it's happening in your church, challenge it. You can't take this city like that. You wake up in the morning for a meeting that is built for 8 or 9. And you're coming by 10, 11, 12. You don't know the serious human being. The way in which will kill you here, you will not understand. It will chop you like meat pie. Go and observe your local government chairman. If he has a meeting, all the local government will appear. All his cabinet will appear. If governor has a meeting for 10, all of them appear in hotel. There's even order in the secular world. You come to church, there's this order everywhere. And I want to believe it starts with the priesthood. It's the way you train your people that they are going to work with you. You don't dare that in my own ministry. We we'll discipline you severely. It's part of the error you have to change. When you live here, go back to your ministries and set order. Leave politics alone. Yesterday I dealt with that. Leave all this jumping around politicians. Leave that soil of calling. When you finish your work, you won't give your account to any governor. You will give it to your caller. And that's God. What are you going to be telling him when you appeared here? That you left that church he gave you to build. And you were running around politicians and running around traditional rulers and all that. Build those few army God has given you. If there are two, three, four, take them up and inculcate these values in them. Then let them look for other people and start doing the same thing to them. And look for other people and start doing the same thing. You will see how that church will be an organized church. When people come there, it will look like a shrine. It will look like the body of Jesus. People will see order in it. They will see unity in it. They will see the power of God in it. They will see the wisdom of God in that church. This is what drove me here. I've seen the desolation all over a boy. I'm sure I'm going to come back to Isaiah South again. I'm sure I'm going to come back and it's going to be very, very soon again. All this desolation in South East, everywhere, especially a boy, go to our cities or to our towns and villages, everywhere, looking like no discipline, no order, no organization, everything is upside down and all that. Our leaders are running here and there. And the reason it pains me the most is because I'm from this state. And I'm taking up the challenge to pay the price, give my life completely to see this nonsense white. Somebody was telling me out there, it was actually Reverend Canon Ike who was telling me, I shouldn't have even mentioned his name, but he was telling me, he said, one thing about your people, sir, which is a culture they must deal with if not it deals with their future is this political ministry they are running. And not just that, this stomach infrastructure ministry. You see, pastors in a boy are more interested in what they would eat than interested in developing themselves. I think I'm telling the truth. When you go, tell the pastors in the land that that guy that came here didn't spare word. He wired us. He gave us injection. And then when the next is coming, please go and collect your injection. You are sick. You need to get treatment. Stomach infrastructure ministry. When governor calls for ministers now, oh, the whole town will be full. And why are you dear to go and collect 1,000 naira? You spent 1,005 or 2,000 all the way from your village or all the way from Africa and came to town only to struggle over 1,000. Is something wrong with you guys? And struggle for food. That's why when I came, I told the PFN chairman, clearly, I wrote it, I told him, I said, pay for the transport of your people. 
wherever they are. Mobilize your people. Make her available. I won't give you guys one couple. I didn't come here to give you guys money. You are the one who should give me money for blessing you. I hope you know that. Hmm. When something is coming to bless you, you should pay the price to receive it. Thank God I have a covenant brother here who I'm going to be bringing up very soon. He will tell you where we travel to get what we have. What pain, right? What pain? He will tell you. Conferences, you will enter until you've paid your school fees. Different kind of training. And then you don't go by leg, we go by flight. We will pay flight, enter Lagos, pay flight, enter Abuja, travel from here, enter Porakot, travel from here, Enugu. We are traveling all over the places to get trainings for this stuff. And then our own ministers in a boy here, from a boy in land, are waiting for when they will get information from government house that there's a rally, that is a program, and then they can start running down there. I catch you there again. <laughs> amen and amen. Sit down and build your ministries. Paul said to Archippus, take it to the ministry you've received from the Lord, that you do what? Fulfill it. When they did COVID-19 lockdown, some group of pastors came to my church, and they said they were coming to check for COVID-19 protocol. If not, if we are not observing it, they will see the church. I said, shame on you. I said, the government is using church against the church. You are the tax force on COVID-19, and you are a pastor. The guy was still there waiting to explain to I said, get out from here. If you don't leave this place, I will send my boys to beat you and walk you out of this place. The guy adjusted. You can't do it in Lagos, where they know something. Yeah, your urban ministers there know how ministry should be done. Can you get Bishop Oerebo to be running around like that? Can you get Kumi to be running around like that? Can you get all those men to be running around like that? Where is our own Bishop Oedipus in this land? The problem is our ministries are upside down. This is part of the order we came here to bring. See how God can help you. We may have started a revival without knowing it all. But I want to think a revival has begun. Because I'm sure next time I come back, I'm going to see the fruit of this labor. I'm very sure of that. Very, very sure of that. I'm going to leave it at this five. Bow your heads and let's talk to God. We believe you've been transformed by the wonders of God's Word. For additional information about us, you can visit our website at www.princetonhills.org. You can also send us a mail at info at princetonhills.org or call 70 Three three one six six seven six two or zero eight one three one five 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 seven four seven. Princeton Hills Ministries raising global, global leaders. Global leaders.